Welcome to What's Not Priced In, a weekly investor podcast by Fattail Investment Research. In a world of confusion and rapid change, experts Kirill Prakopenka and Greg Canavan look behind the headlines to unveil the hidden opportunities within the Australian stock market. Now, let's dive in to today's episode. G'day everyone and welcome to this special bonus edition of uh, What's Not Priced In. Uh, now, regularly, you hear from Kirill and I on a Friday afternoon for the standard What's Not Priced In episode, where we talk about markets and uh, risks and opportunities that we're seeing each week. Uh, but what I've been doing recently is a little side project for What's Not Priced In is talking to some specialists throughout Australia about the energy transition that Australia is going through. And uh, I certainly think that many of the risks uh, involved in this energy transition are certainly not priced into markets and that's partly because it is a very long-term theme but nonetheless i think it's a theme that's worth discussing uh, and i think that we're not being told the full story of the cost of this transition uh, and i wanted to speak to some experts to give you a, a bit of a, a take on the topic that isn't being talked about in the mainstream media too much so this week, uh, I'm chatting with uh, Rob Parker, who is the founder of Nuclear for Climate Australia. Uh, Rob has got vast experience in the engineering project management uh, area, uh, and he's very well versed in the economics of nuclear energy. And in this video, uh, or in this interview, we really get stuck into, I guess, the areas or the regions that have uh, uh, tried nuclear and are doing quite well with it and have considerably lower energy costs than Australia. As I said, this isn't a story that you're hearing about much in the mainstream media at all. And I think it's really important uh, for those of you who are thinking about long-term wealth management and some of the risks that might be uh, on the table for Australians and, and how their uh, wealth is, uh, or how wealth is being created in this country. I think it's well worth uh, a listen and, and hopefully give you some food for thought. Uh, so we should be running this project for the next month or so, give you a bonus uh, video uh, every every week or every other week, depending on how many people I talk to on this topic. Uh, but for now, um, have a watch of uh, myself talking to Rob Parker. As I said, hope you get something out of it. Uh, it's really interesting chat. Um, and we'll see you uh, for another bonus edition in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Bye. Rob Parker, thanks very much for joining us today. And it's good to be with you, Greg. Now, Rob, you are the founder of Nuclear for Climate Australia. Um, so I wanted to get you uh, in today to, to chat about Australia's energy transition, because it's obviously quite a contentious transition. We are told constantly how we are moving towards a renewables only economy. But what's not talked about so much is the, the costs involved uh, for that transformation and indeed whether it is even possible. Uh, and given that your your background, uh, I thought you'd be the perfect person to to chat to uh, about this transition and, and maybe highlight some of the issues, challenges, and certainly some of the things that we're not being told uh, about uh, about this transition. And of course, uh, the conversation will turn to the ability of nuclear power to, uh, I, I guess, solve some of these problems. So perhaps we could just start with a bit of background, uh, how you got into this role um, and, and, where, and where you've been previously. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, I've had a career of about 37 years as a construction and design civil engineer. I rose to the position of project manager on some very, very large projects in Australia and overseas. And so I've been, my working life has been devoted to the profitable and efficient operations of businesses, which basically what a project is, running a business profitably. So I've always had, you might say, a very rational, economic, uh, functional way of going about things. That's the engineering basis of what a civil engineer is meant to do. Um, early in the 2000s, I got concerned about the issue of climate change. And uh, I was working in Southeast Asia on some large dams and also in Australia. and uh, I wanted to get involved in this particular issue. And so within our community in the Southern Highlands, I formed a climate change group and they initially had about 300 members. It was a very, very effective group. During the course of that, I started to think that we needed to be looking at nuclear. I had a sense that nuclear, we're talking here back around 2004, 2005, okay? 
And I got in touch with Dr. James Hansen, who was the advisor to four US presidents on climate change matters, sometimes known as the grandfather of climate change. And, and James I, I assisted in financing a visit to Australia with the St. James Ethics Centre and Sydney Uni. And James convinced me that we needed to be looking at nuclear as our solution to man-made greenhouse gas reduction. So we needed to have plentiful energy to be able to sort this problem. Unfortunately, we saw at the same time a divide between people who are ideologically opposed to the use of nuclear energy, but notwithstanding that, their heart was in the right place and they were keen on environmental matters. And that, that caused, that is a, an existing division within our body politic. I then went on and got involved with more nuclear, and then I went off and did a master's in nuclear science so that I, at ANU, so that I fully understood the technology. Okay, and I went around this whole issue quite rigorously. And um, then I became, I joined the Australian Nuclear Association. I became the vice president and the president of the Australian Nuclear Association um, because I was pretty strong on advocacy. And along the way, I have visited nuclear facilities in France, South Korea, the United States and Canada. I've taken study tours and particularly the one in South Korea was really incredible looking at the vertical integration of their nuclear supply chain and why they are able to build plants so cheaply on cost and on budget. So that's my study tours that have been clearly embedded in the rational um, engineering focus on how one would deliver a nuclear energy. And I must say people have been very generous in, in affording Australians doing this because with our laws in place, we really are tire kickers. It's a bit embarrassing, but that, that's the truth of the matter. So um, subsequent to being the president of the Australian Nuclear Association, I'm concentrated on the Nuclear for Climate campaign, and that's growing strongly with the increasing interest in Australians uh, on, on the topic of nuclear energy to address our emissions reductions and also deliver us low-cost energy. Um, because I think there is a growing perception in the body politic and in the people that um, we are in a bad place. And we're going to talk about that today on our electricity prices and our inability to deliver uh, manufacturing and industry to Australians. So we have got to change our way. So that's a potted history of Rob Parker's journey to nuclear energy. Well, it's a it's a it's a fair uh, it's a fair history, and I know you've got a, a bit of a presentation you want to take us through today in terms of what other uh, countries have been down this journey. Uh, but before we get to that, I've I've heard yes. you talk before uh, about Australia's relic economy. Uh, I thought it might just be worth touching on that to yes. set the stage for some of the problems that we've got. Yes, and and I'll be showing you a slide later on about this. The term relic economy is something I coined, which is used which I use to look at nations who are no longer have the backbone, no longer have the confidence as a manufacturing nation. And so we lose, we tend to lose our way economically. And we've done this in Australia, particularly with things like the automobile, automobile manufacturing, our steel manufacturing, our metals delivery systems. And when we talk about things like uh, demand response, um, in other words, you cut back the supply of electricity, you're going to really destroy industry by that kind of concept. So we've got to get good uh, electricity supply going. So I coined this term relic economy, which is uh, an economy based upon real estate, litigation, um, insurance and coffee. And we don't have any more manufacturing. And some people applaud this concept. I think. The other word for it is the service economy. Yeah, it's another euphemism. All these things that are, shall we say, the soft arts and not the hard nosed arts. The problem with the relic, relic economy is that manufacturing and science drives intellectual horsepower in nations. And uh, if we look at the, the people in, in Ontario in particular, three quarters of the population, the adult population of Ontario, have post-secondary school qualifications. It's the highest in the OECD. 
And that is on the back of establishing strong manufacturing. So that's the term relic economy. I think it's a I think it's a great term, and uh, maybe as you as you bring your presentation up, it's a good way to talk about the fact that Australia is uh, targeting eighty two percent renewables by two thousand and thirty. Uh, we are probably way behind that target anyway. Yet the damage being done to our electricity. Uh, system or the costs that are being posed on that electricity system uh, are significant and haven't been communicated to the public and haven't been fully understood by the public. And I think it's a really good point you make about the relic economy, because as this transition continues, we risk losing that expertise, we risk losing that manufacturing capability, uh, the, the the science, technology, all those sorts of things. Um, and partly, you know, I, I hope this is what you can bring to the conversation is opening people's eyes up to these uh, longer term risks that we're facing within the economy. So what we're, we're confronting here and why build nuclear and, and what is the problem we're suffering with respect to these renewables coming into the build? And I'll go to this particular image here. When we tried to power our energy system with high levels of renewables, and this here is an image of one of the integrated system plan scenarios from AEMA, our electricity, uh, Australian Electricity Marketing Organization. And they have increasing levels of renewables going into our system. And by that, you've got the variable renewables of solar, and wind, and then we've got the better, more reliable supply in hydro. And when we try to intro, introduce those, and I'll just describe what this graph shows. So along the base here, that's our days of a month, okay, horizontal. And up the side here, well, that's the that's the amount of actual power we're producing in terms of megawatts. And the heavy black line, well, that represents our demand. Low in the, low in the evening, um, very high in the day. And what we've got um, between those points, we have a lot of solar in the daytime and we have a quite variable amount of wind. And so when we try to operate a system like that, <clears throat> we incur significant costs in particular, as you see on that image, there is a lot of actual spilled energy. A lot of the, the, the um, solar will actually not actually be used. And that's a problem because that implies an overbuild. Why would you have an overbuild? Well, if you're going to power the nation on solar, 50% solar, for example, in a winter, then you're going to need to size your system for the amount of solar we actually achieve in winter. Well, of course, in summer, that's going to mean you have about double the capacity. So what you're doing is you are building in a redundancy in your system to cope with seasonal variations. With wind as well, we get massive, we get significant wind droughts. Actually, some of them go for four and five days where the entire NEM is only powered at around about 5 to 10% of the capacity factor. And sometimes we'll be up 60 to 70%. So we have these massive amounts of variability. They need to be handled. And on this image, you can see these pink colors. That's our storage, okay? It could be pump storage. It could be batteries. When you analyze the grid, you find that often these resources are only operating at around 5 10% capacity factor. That's the sort of thing we would have with snowy mountains. And not only that, the overall average capacity, capacity factor for wind and solar in Australia is in the region of, of 20 through to about 32% capacity factor. Notwithstanding that, the transmission lines that need to be connected to these need to be sized to take 100% of the time when it is outputting. So the new transmission system we build 
has got to be sized for the maximum output in the knowledge that you're only going to be operating at, shall we say, 20 to 30 percent on average. This is the problem of overbuild, and this is where the cost comes from. Now, I'll touch briefly on these two images, um, or this one. What we see in this particular image is that if we take the large Sydney basin as the load, and we take those black lines there, that's our existing system. We have large coal plants sitting up here in the upper Hunter. This is simplistic. It doesn't go to the entire network, but it's used as a simple way to describe the system. And we have a single black line going out to Dubbo to power that, down to Canberra. Well, we've got a couple of black lines because we've got a much bigger uh, urban area down in Canberra, and we've got a connection through to the snowy. And so in black, you see the system that we've currently got based on our coal and gas. When we introduce renewables into the system, they're, they're going to be powered in what we're calling renewable energy zones. And so we'll just put one of those in, the Irana region out around Dubbo, about 250K or 200K out of Sydney. And what we need to do in pink, we need to build out 500,000 volt lines out to the Irana region, whereas the president's got about 132,000. Out to Dubbo, we have this large pink line going to the renewable energy zone. But because in that earlier image I showed you, we had a lot of spilled solar and a lot of spilled wind, that needs to go into storage. Now, that was the intention, of course, of Snowy Hydro 2.0. And so you need to have this new transmission constructed all the way down to Snowy 2.0 to go into pump storage. Now, that could be also transmission going to um, other pump storages or other things such as battery. But simplistically, we need to build that type of transmission going into storage. Then we need to be able to bring all that energy back out of storage. And so we need to be building more pink lines to recover that renewables. So what we are, in effect, doing, we are building a system of new transmission, which AMO tells us, um, so they start at 10,000 kilometres and then sometimes I see 28,000 kilometres. That seems to be a, a number that's in a bit of flux. Mm -hmm. So we get this huge diversity of network. And so we're building this pink system, which will be three or four times larger than the existing centralised system. So that is one of the major cost drivers of the renewable energy system. It's the storage, the pump storage, the battery storage, and that large transmission system, which is overbuilt to compart to enable it to address peaks in, in output. And the big economic risk for Australia is that there is no nation on the on the planet that has effectively decarbonized with wind and solar. It just has not happened. Some have had reliance upon their neighbours, for example, Denmark. Sure, they do it, but they're reliant upon the EU grid as a backup. We don't have that luxury. So you won't find anyone that does it without reliance on their neighbours. This is the risk. This is the huge economic risk. Now, if we build all this transmission and storage, then we've got this huge asset, which could be a stranded asset. Because if we look at Energiewende in Germany and we look at the situation in California, everything points to a system reliant upon high level of renewables as being the highest cost system we could go for. And what we need to be looking at is a nuclear system or using our existing network to its maximum with a very low environmental footprint and economic footprint of nuclear. And so, so Rob, just, okay. to, just to be clear, the, the, those transmission lines in pink that you're talking about, yes. the reason why we're building so much of it is because it needs to exist to take the maximum load 
although that maximum load will only happen 30% of the time. So effectively, we're, we're, we're overbuilding, overcapacity, purely to take a small amount of, of uh, maximum transmission from the renewables. That is correct. But also, we're having to, we're having to take that surplus production over demand into storage. And those storages are in remote locations. They're not, they're not sitting in the load centres. Or you can do that with batteries, but you certainly can't do it with pump hydro. And, that's and there is a lot of talk about batteries, but how far, I'm, I'm not sure if your engineering expertise extends to battery technology, but it seems to be a long way from being anywhere near uh, grid, grid capacity storage, right? That's correct. At present, in fact, almost all the batteries are really being used for grid, short-term grid stabilisation of voltage yep. and frequency. And we're talking here about responses in about half an hour or the, or one hour. The mind game one needs to play, though, is to think, how do I change, how do I store and release energy over the one week, the one month, or the seasonal change? And keep in mind that when you exhaust the energy out of your storage, you've still got to meet the existing demand. And on top of that, you've got to stop, to, you've got to charge the storage up for the next time on which it's going to be called upon. So yep. You end up with a double whammy effect going on here, which makes storage a very expensive proposition and why you need a lot of transmission to actually do this. We have a further effect, which has not been discussed at all, really, so far by AMO. In fact, they are playing doggo on it. And that is the cost of our distribution center system. Now, you've probably heard that a lot of people are suggesting that with a renewable energy future, we can power, be powering our grid out of our domestic level batteries and our car storages. Okay, we, we hear a fair bit of this distributed energy resource. Okay, now, if you're going to do that sort of thing, then you've got to be able to pass very large amounts of energy from the domestic level up into the high voltage grid. To be able to power the society you know yep. if you're going to be using all these domestic batteries and car batteries to basically enable high voltage uh supply into large energy users that's got to all come back through the distribution system and isn't, so isn't isn't that argument though that um if everyone has solar you'll be able to power your home and your car and therefore reduce your need to consume energy from the grid isn't that the argument of the electrification people Yes, that, that, that is quite correct. But if you do the numbers on trying to coincidentally power your home and your car, um, we're going to need some very big roofs and that doesn't provide any ability for people in high density living to do that. Yeah. So pity help the people, as I say, who are in the small blocks, the 800 or 450 square metre blocks with houses close by or in multi-storey or in... Um, in, in townhouse developments, they just don't have that option. Yeah, It's all right for people in remote areas like me, you know, living in pretty luxurious circumstances. I've got to meet, you know, got, got a big roof. I could do it. But that option is not available for the majority of people. And it's certainly not available for lower income people who are cash strapped to be able to live that lifestyle. The, the Teslas that we're seeing going around in the large roofs are largely uh, a luxury for an upper middle class who are able to afford that. But that will not happen for the, the chalkies and, and, and the police and all the people on lower incomes. This uh, is a real problem on how they're going to afford that sort of system. Absolutely. Look, I've got a decent sized roof myself, but some days when the clouds are uh, over, I, I can't even um, heat my heat my water properly. So um, yeah. look, that I think there's massive challenges from that perspective, but bringing it back to this cost of the, the renewables, we're, we're constantly told that renewables are the cheapest form of energy, but I'm, I'm assuming none of that incorporates the cost of transmission none of that incorporates the cost of the the variability and the stresses on the grid and the additional cost required to stabilize that variable energy coming through can can you maybe talk us through that a little bit okay we have um this energy model which has been designed by dr robert barr who's an electricity expert 
Um, this image of the, that you can see now, I'm going to talk about, and it'll address the questions you came to. Yep. What we do in that energy model is we take all of the costs from CSIRO's gen cost reports, the wind, the solar, the gas, the fueling costs of all of those. And we put that into a model, which, um, and it's a bit complex to discuss, but in, in principle, it takes um, over a three year period at five minute slices, and we're able to model the amount of wind and solar, which historically is, is um, outputted in those periods. And that gives us a thing which our EMO use and we use called the wind or solar trace. If you like, it's the wind, it's the waveform of wind and solar over a three year period of output. And you can use that, you can amplify that wind trace or solar trace uh, into your models. And so what that trace shows you, for example, with wind, you'll have a period when you may only be getting a 5 10% capacity factor. So it's got within it the point when it's low and the point when it's very high. The, the solar trace shows you the, the cloudy days. It shows you those days in winter with reduced output and in summer with high output. And you layer those over in the energy model so that you have a very good predictive tool for the responses on a three year period, I must mention it's from 2017, 2020, of the response of wind and solar over that three year period. Now, you can then use that as a predictive tool for how the costs will, will work. And so we load into that model, coal, gas, solar, and wind, and we put in various combinations. That enables us to model what AEMO's cost systems are. And we can look at those in, in a minute. And we get an output which shows us, if we choose a, a, a high renewables one, we can have a cost to it. If we have a nuclear one, we have a cost to it. And so in this particular image, what we're seeing is the type of generation we found to be the optimum low cost generation for Australia. Uh, which happens to be a nuclear uh, scenario. In this case, it's 70% nuclear with about 11% solar utility solar, 6% rooftop solar, a 7% from our existing hydro, and in this case, 76% nuclear. And that has a, a, a that particular model run has an emissions intensity of only 22 grams. And that type of system uses our existing grid. We don't need right. any grid enhancement. So the nuclear plants are built at the nodal points of the grid. So this doesn't include any uh, wind, I, I note, is that? No, we dropped wind out of it. The problem with wind is that it is an open invitation because of its random variability. It's an open invitation for a lot of storage or gas. Yeah. And when you put wind into these systems, you actually get um, more cost because of the backup. Now, from a pragmatic perspective, we will be stuck with wind if we go down the nuclear route. So you put a bit in for a more pragmatic run, but they would eventually wear out. I mean, they, they were really only truthfully got a lifespan of 10 to 20 years. And so they, 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 the natural attrition would would resolve that matter. Which uh, is is another reason why this whole, whole transition just seems, from a logical perspective, quite mad in that if you're building out wind farms at considerable capital costs and their lifespan is, let's say, 20 years, 25 years max, uh, it just seems insane that after 25 years, you have to replace it. Again, are those costs, are those uh, shorter-term uh, costs relative to, say, uh, a nuclear power plant, which could theoretically run for 50, 60, 70 years. Is that a fair comparison? Because you just mentioned yes, it is. It is. you mentioned the Gen Cost report uh, that I think just came out last week, and it's a CSIRO report uh, along with AMIO. And they constantly talk about wind and solar being the lowest cost form of energy or form of additional energy sources, while nuclear is 
all the way up here and not worth even discussing. Yet that model that you just put in front of us suggested that the best optimum uh, mix for low energy costs and low emissions is 76% nuclear. So perhaps do you have a, a, a cost of that model compared to what, say, consumers are paying now in the NEM or the national okay. electricity market? Thanks Thanks for that question. And, and that's why I put this slide up here now. Right, okay. And there's some really inf interesting info on this slide. This comes from a talk I gave last night to the Royal Society. <clears throat> what I'll touch on first over here on the left of this to put the listeners and viewers of this podcast into perspective. There's a, a low-cost um, energy provider in Australia called Amber, and you can, you can get some quotes off their Amber site. And I did that on the 17th of the 7th, and according to Amber, in New South Wales, they quoted me 30 cents per kilowatt hour, Victoria 23, ACT 24, Queensland 29, South Australia, with all their lovely renewables, 34, okay? And if you went to Energy Australia, who are not as low cost as uh, as Amber is, you possibly add three or four cents to all of those numbers, okay? Just to be clear, is this the wholesale cost of electricity? This or is, is this not, the this is retail. retail this is cost. to mums and dads out of the wall. Yep. Okay? Then a friend of mine in Ontario, two days ago, sent me his energy bill from Ontario, and he is paying 14 cents Canadian with an exchange rate of 1.1, call it 15.4 Australian. So in Ontario, at Cold Down Place, their, their basic energy cost, electrical energy cost, approximately half ours. Okay, and that, that's the alarm bell. Mm. And we're going to have more and more incre incremental increases. We've got them coming towards the end of this month, we're going to have about another 30% increase in electricity prices. So watch out for your hats, what's going to happen to these numbers. Now, that sets the scene for, for the anxiety, which we should all feel about where our energy prices and our society is going. We model this. Now, I showed your views that those other energy plots, traces for nuclear and renewables, and they are all summated in this chart here. So the, what we have up this vertical column, that's cents per kilowatt hour. And along the base here, we have the description of some different scenarios, energy scenarios. So here we've got uh, the NEM. The first column is the NEM in 2022. That's, if you like, our control. Yep. Then we have the next one, the integrated system plan hydrogen superpower. This is the eulogizing about how what a wonderful world of hydrogen we can have. And um, that's the integrated system plan from IMO, AEMO in 2050. Then we have the one that's generally promoted most strongly is the step change scenario from AEMO. Then we have the progressive, that is a less aggressive move. And then we have two nuclear scenarios. Here we've got a 49% and here we've got a 70%. Yep. The blue represents as close as possible to the wholesale market cost of energy, not price. Uh, no doubt people who are listening to this will be aware of the fundamental difference between price and cost. So this is the cost of the generation. The amber, what that is, that's the incremental increase that high voltage users like Sydney trains Verima Cement Works near me or any of your high voltage or an aluminium smelter paint. And then we go to into green and that's the inter incremental increase that you and I and most commercial and industrial users are paying out of the wall. Okay. And so back in 2022, we have about 23 cents. And that was pretty well where we were actually in the retail cost of energy. So we've got pretty good control going there. Oh, I should interrupt right now and say that the model uses the costs published from AEMO's integrated system plan. Our wind, our solar, all of those are what go into this predictive model. 
including gas and coal and all of those, with the exception of nuclear. We do not agree with their nuclear cost. And into this model, we have used a cost for nuclear of $7,400 per kilowatt, okay? And I'll, we'll come to that in more detail later. When we load those in, we have the 23 cents because that's basically wind, solar, coal and gas. Go to the hydrogen superpower, you're up to 51. That's where we're gonna generate hydrogen and burn that through gas turbines to get low emissions. <clears throat> then we go to the step change scenario where we've now got a little bit of gas sitting in the system still. That's the backup to all the, the emergency backup. Yep. And so we've got uh, 47 cents. Then we go to the progressive where we've got still more gas sitting in there, a little bit of coal, and that's 37 cents. Then when we go down to our two nuclear scenarios, we get 29 and 25 per quarter. Okay. The reason that why 49 is more expensive slightly than 70% than is because you've got more renewables going in here and that reduces the capacity factor of the nuclear power plants. Note the red line. The reason apparently we're doing all of this energy change is to reduce carbon emissions. So yeah. under this scenario, we're up at around 700 grams NEM wide. We get down to 51 under the hydrogen plan and we get to 138 under the step change, about 236 under the progressive, down to 79 for 49% uh, nuclear and down to 17 for our 70% um, nuclear. So that gives us a strong indication of where we need to be going. Now, um, therefore, the, the nuclear cost is the contentious one. And you might like to, we might have a bit of a chat about that on the gen cost scenario. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's something that uh, listeners would be interested in because obviously that's what the the, the mainstream narrative is, that, that we, we can't go down a nuclear path because it's too expensive. And if we build, built out a nuclear fleet, fleet we'd be paying uh, a huge amount of cost for our electricity. So... Uh, and I note that Ontario isn't paying a huge amount of cost for their electricity, yet they have considerable nuclear fleets. So perhaps we could we could talk about that in a little little bit more detail. I think that's that's a good idea. Um, there's been some great work done by an economist in Canada, Eduardo Sepulveda, who he came up. Now our model shows the outputs in this form. Okay. So we've got basically a two to one ratio between really high renewables and nuclear. Keep that number in mind, about two to one. Edgardo's put out a similar sort of information in another format, this type of image here on the left of the screen. And what he's showing there is along one horizontal line, as you tighten up on your emissions profile from about 400 grams, keep in mind in Australia, we're way out here, to about 400, 800 grams. Yep. As you get back down the, the, the line, you get down to about one. And then this horizontal line going across the front, well, that's the line of how much nuclear you're allowed to have. So you go from in the corner, the front corner here, you go from nuclear is fully enabled over to the right-hand side where you can't have any nuclear in the scenario. Yep. And so what he's showing in this three-dimensional image is that when you deny yourself nuclear, then as you move to the right and you reduce your emissions, you start to go asymptotic. You're going up that curve very steeply and you're getting a three or four-fold increase in your energy costs compared to enabling nuclear. And the crossover point is pretty clear there that <clears throat> if you enable about... Um, 100% down to 60% nuclear, you don't have much problem. The minute you go under 60% nuclear and you let the renewables interfere with the runtime on the nuclear, that's when the costs take off. Um, We've actually seen a, a, an example of that happening with the coal stations in the yeah. past five, five or six years, haven't we? As the increased renewables have come into the system, it's played havoc with the, the traditional mode of, of uh, coal-fired generation. So. Like 
quite correct. And that's, yep. that's the problem. On the right-hand side of the screen, we see the, the generation um, that fed into that model of, El, of Edgardo's. And this is from an OECD document. This is not from some hairy, hairy nose wombat article. This is pretty well researched and peer reviewed. Now on the right-hand side, you see effectively that if you enable nuclear on the right-hand side, you really don't change your overall capacity at all going into your grid. On your left-hand side, where you have renewables, your overall generation mix will go up about six-fold compared to a nuclear one to enable it. And what I'm getting at is there, it's not only the wind and solar, but it's all the storage and yep. all of the interconnections that go between them. Now, we therefore decided, and you, you introduced this issue of discussion about why Canada, and I'll touch on that now in this, in this slide. Um, and we compared here Ontario versus New South Wales plus Victoria. And we see some really interesting parameters here. The population of Ontario and that of New South Wales plus Victoria is virtually identical. Mm. Okay. It's 14.7 million. The land area is actually, um, I've left out a decimal point here. Uh, Ontario is 1.076 million square kilometres. New South Wales plus Victoria is 1.028 million square kilometres. Okay. So effectively, we're the same land area, same population. We have the same laws. We have the same culture. We have the same integration of a lot of um, migrants coming into the country to enhance our economic build out. So our, our populations look very similar. We have the same dynamic of the political narrative, and we have the same issues to concern ourselves with how we integrate our societies with the people who were here before we moved into this continent. And Canada's got the same issue to resolve as does Australia. Okay, So everything in the two nations is so similar. Um, it's not funny, except when we go to the next bunch of parameters. And this is where the shock hits. Manufacturing in Ontario is 315 billion per annum. And in New South Wales and Victoria, it's 238 billion. That's a big difference. Mm. Our electricity emissions in 2020, according to the regulator in Ontario, they were 25 grams. In brackets, I've put 80. Um, they're doing a rehabilitation, a lot of their older nuclear power plants. And as they do those, they have to put a bit more gas in there while they pull some generators out. So if you looked at it today, it'd be up around 80. Yep. Okay. Um, and in uh, New South Wales and Victoria, because we're the two states predominantly running either brown coal or black coal, we're at 798 combined. Okay, so we're about 32 times greater. Ontario has got 60% nuclear with 18 reactors and about 13 gigawatts of capacity. Lo and behold, we don't have any. And then when you look at the electricity generation, they're putting out a bit more electricity to power that manufacturing. So that gives you a snapshot of the comparison of the two provinces and versus states. And it's, it flows through then into a discussion of what is this Canadian nuclear fleet that's enabling them to get such a wonderful reduction on their emission. And what we see over there is they have got three very large power plants. Bruce, which is one of the largest in the world at 6.2 gigawatts. Darlington, which we visited, has got four reactors at three and a half gigawatts. And Pickering, which is their oldest plant, six reactors at three gigawatts. It gives them a total of 12.8 gigawatts, 18 reactors, and they built those in 20 years. Um, you've got Point La Pro there, which I think is from one of their other provinces as, as off to the side. When you say they built them in 20 years, Rob, uh, how, how long ago are we talking? Were they built in the 60s or the 70s or, or no, the, later? The 80s through to the 90s. Okay. Yes. It was in that period. And they're all, um, I think we're going to touch on that later. Well, I'll just mention them now. What they did is they 
because they didn't have uranium, uh, didn't have an enrichment facility and they didn't have large forging capacity, they built their own technology called CANDU, which is Canadian Natural Uranium Deuterium Moderated Reactor. Clumsy word. It means that they can operate their reactors off natural uranium. Right. And also they have they put the uranium into tubes, a bit like an old steam locomotive with its hot tubes going through the boilers. Um, and that's how they put the uranium up a bunch of tubes and the water passes through those tubes into the steam generators. So they're not using a single large forging. Um, now, we've seen some big things happening in Ontario over the last couple of months, or a couple of years, actually, but coalescing in the last month. In the week of the 3rd of July, they announced they're going to add 4.8, 4,800 megawatts of new nuclear at Bruce. So that's on top of the 6.8. That'll take them up to 11 gigawatts, making it the largest nuclear power plant in the world. They're adding another, we went over to Canada to actually, and I'll touch on this shortly, to look at their BWX300 small modular reactor. And uh, they've decided that that thing's going so well, they're going to add another three and they haven't started building it yet. But believe me, the numbers they're doing on this down to the micromanaging. So they're so confident they're going to build four of those now rather than the one. There are more announcements to come. And they've got an anticipation of a very significant lift in their electricity demand. Over the last couple of years, they've invested in 17 billion or, or investors have chosen to put 17 billion into the Toronto economy, mainly into EV manufacture. And so Volkswagen has left Germany, the basket case of renewables in EU, and they've moved their battery manufacturing over to Ontario for their motor vehicle. We've got LG, Stellantis, um, and uh, and Unicor are also building large EV and battery manufacturing facilities in Ontario. Um, they were attracted there because of the 24-7 net zero emissions electricity in the place. Airbus, well, they're manufacturing the A320, A220 fleet in the neighbouring state, but a lot of the actual components are made in Ontario, as are the Airbus helicopters. So they've got a, a huge industrial base that's moving on. Um, so that gives you a bit of an overview. I think possibly we may touch briefly on that costing out of the AMO report. Um, because as you, you've observed, they've got some very large costs of about $18,000 per kilowatt or something yep. installed. Now, our assessment, and having sat across the room from people who are actually buying and building one of these things, our assessment of the cost in Australia of small modular reactors on a fleet basis is closer to 7,400, 7,400 per kilowatt. Most tellingly in the AEMO report, they do not even mention large reactors. Yep. There's no mention of them. Yet of the 50 or 60 nuclear power plants being out there in the world right now being built, all but one, a large nuclear power plant. So they are silent on the technology. We're seeing Poland currently going through the contract period process to build new nuclear power plants in Poland. Westinghouse is going to through Bechtel, through Bechtel are going to build three AP1000. Um, we know the prices of those tenders. We should be looking at those prices as a, as, as a lead. And I've, I've looked at those prices. And uh, this figure of 7,400, both for small and large reactors, is what we're using, because I know what the price base of those tenders is. Um, and that, and that's, that's including, uh, I, I guess, the non-construction costs of the correct. regulatory overlay that, that uh, I, I guess bedevils the industry quite a bit, right? Because there's a huge amount of regulatory costs that uh, are laid onto uh, nuclear construction. Look, you have to be really careful and you raise some really good points. That 
People get on doom and gloom and funks over nuclear because of a first of a kind cost in a place and they say, oh, it's blowing out. You have to back yourself to do it on a fleet-wide basis to derive yep. the, be the benefits of the economy. Korea built four large APR 1400s in Baraka and they did it at around about the 4,500 US um, per kilowatt. Barracas in the UAE, where they... In the United they, Arab Emirates. Yep. The tenders closed recently for overnight costs of nuclear in Poland. Um, the Korean price was about 3,500 US per kilowatt. Um, and uh, for the AP1000, built by Bechtel, they're up at about 4,500. Um, I'm tending to put about a 40% loading on that to quote to uh, to attend um, client overheads, enabling facilities to do the, to do the sort of construction, the financing during the course of construction. So you've got to really load those overnight costs up, and when I do that, that's when I get to about the 7,400, and that's in line with the publications you're seeing coming out of the International Energy Association reports yep. for nuclear new build. Um, but that's what we can do as, as individuals. And we really need people, unfortunately, at CSIRO don't appear to be up to the job. Um, the paymasters aren't interested. They don't even publish stuff on large nuclear. We've got new nuclear going into Egypt, Turkey, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. I mean, do people really think people of Bangladesh are paying eighty thousand dollars a kilowatt for those reactors on the Ganges? I mean, yeah. you know, we we've got to approach this thing with more resolve to get these costs right. And the Canadians are certainly not doing that. So what's but, what's the what's the story then, Rob? Because if if I if I'm honest, I'm thinking th there is another reason other than costs of why we're not pursuing nuclear and and the cynic in me says there is so much money in renewables for the people who are building out the uh the network that they don't really care about nuclear and the fact that nuclear can be done cheaply and nuclear can be done for the longer term benefit of the country's energy prices and therefore uh standards of living environmental impacts of lower emissions it seems to be that there is so much money in the renewables rollout for vested interests that nuclear is best just being shoved to the side. Yes. And let's think about the mechanism of how that's happened. Um, under the RAN Labor government in New South Wales, uh, we built the coal fleet. Okay. Now that was built out by the New South Wales government and Victoria did similarly with the coal. So large infrastructure historic in Australia has been built by government. And if you take coal plants or if you take nuclear plants around the globe, the large low cost fleets have all been built by government. Okay. And then we choose in some locales, for example, in Australia, our, popula our politicians elected to sell those off, particularly when they knew that there were problems coming in with carbon. So they sold some of these nuclear, these coal plants off. Oh, some of them went for about 10 million, some went for about 40 million bucks. I mean, yep. and then people made a huge killing on, on having bought them. Yep. Now, so, the, and, and our transmission system likewise was privatized. And so what we do as a population is we, we grab an asset we currently own, we flog it off, so you've got the delta for the interest on the purchasing on that goes in on top of our bills. And we now no longer have any control over our destiny. Okay. And the people in Canada have not done that. Um, all their nuclear power plants were built by the government and they are still on regulated asset bases operating into the grid. And so that we've really got to think about, you know, going back to the days of a regulated asset based system. So um this is the problem of building infrastructure. The politicians have abrogated their responsibility in terms of building major infrastructure. 
Now then in flows this concept of, okay, renewables aren't working so well, so we'll come to SMRs. And on this image, um, we have the uh, concept of, for example, why SMRs? Well, if, if the SMR political... SMR being a small, small modular, modular reactor. reactor. Yeah, yeah. It's a marketing term. Um, the notion being that if politicians are not going to use sovereign guarantee to build the large plants, then we have to make the capital cost of these things attractive to the private investor, yep. like the AGLs of the world, to build nuclear. And so a design has come across. Now, what small means is that the smaller you go, you go up that cost curve. If you move to the left, your cost goes up. And that's been established in all the conversations I've had around the world with energy, with like nuclear power plant providers. They are big because as you come down, you get an economy of scale. So the hope with small modular reactors is that by making them uh, modular in size, in other words, factory built, um, by making the design simpler and uh, by increasing harmonization, by that term we mean don't change the regulations, have one set of regulations around the globe, it's hoped that by standardizing and harmonizing all the regulatory approaches, that you'll get a more efficient design. Now, a plant that we're going to see shortly, the BWX300 from General Electric, sure, they pulled out 60% of the materials components per unit of output to try to get down, go vertically down on this graph to meet, meet the uh, cost point of large reactors. Well, they're gonna have to do something I'm not saying they won't get there, but it is a very risky proposition. But the reason why one would do this is that then means that instead of investing, shall we say, uh, 12 billion or 10 or 12 billion on a large plant, the investor could be out for say two and a half billion, and that is easier for them to digest, okay, versus their balance sheet. So really the whole tale around SMRs is come up with the cheapest, most reliable design that fits the ability of the um, the electricity providers to actually construct. That, that's really the narrative around them. Um, but, uh, and we can probably move to this one shortly. Um, so that that's the driver. I'm not convinced of it, to be perfectly honest. I look at the tremendous ability of Sweden to build their fleet. I look at the ability of Canada to build their can -dos. I look at the ability of France to build their fleet. Um, around the world, we saw historically fleet construction with sovereign guarantee was the way to go. Um, you, sure, you can go out to tender for those. You can have a regulated asset base. You can then move those into the private sector for the economic operations and maintenance perhaps through a superannuation fund and that type of structure, which is what happened with Bruce in Ontario. Yep. And you can have a regulated market of, of uh, negotiated prices, you know, his, and, and off they go. And that's done in half the United States with, with uh, nuclear power plants. But the so countries, other... you're, the countries you're talking about there, Rob, have all got a, a long history of, of nuclear and, and nuclear construction. And if we bring it back to Australia, uh, nuclear is illegal in this country. We don't have any history uh, of, of nuclear power plants. We've had a fear campaign go through the community for the past 30 years uh, about nuclear waste. So how, how do you view uh, your advocacy for nuclear in terms of the reality of Australia actually adopting this technology? Okay. We go to pre... All right. If we look at the statistics of support in Australia, let's go to the types of polling. I have some slides on that, but I can quote them off, off fairly readily. Yep. I attended a, a conference at MIT. I was invited there in October of last year. And there was a wonderful presentation on the popularity of nuclear throughout all the states of the United States, okay, because it was a, a US centric. And we saw all the dynamics playing out in the United States that play out in Australia. 
And you see the same sorts of fear dynamics play out in Canada as well. Okay. And the closer populations get to nuclear power plants, the more embracing they are of, of, of the concepts. Now, what I think is going to happen in Australia is that the precedent that is evident in places like Ontario and in the United States and throughout Europe, where we are seeing a lot of nations in Europe now come back towards favouring nuclear as price increases go, it will be the, the pressure on the hip pocket will drive people to question, are we going the right way? And I think that's happening in Australia now. And we are seeing uh, polling tell us that about in the low 50% of Australians are in favour of looking at nuclear energy. And then we had the standout poll recently, which was a bit of a shock to me, was in the Q&A episode. I don't know if you saw that. Did you, Greg, the Q&A episode? Try, try not to watch uh, too much okay. Q&A, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I was out at Dubbo at a conference, on, um, and, and, and I was looking at it in my room at the motel. And... Uh, and there was a Newcastle audience and Ted O'Brien, the shadow energy minister, was sitting in there and about 20% of the program was given over to discussion on nuclear. And the compare David Spears got the audience to put their hand up and said, who's in favour of nuclear? And it was no surprise given a, an invited Q&A audience. Um, about uh, a third of the audience was probably in favour, two thirds against, you know, of that order from what I saw in the camera. Yep. But they had 16,400 people voted on the poll outside. And the result was 61% in favour, 32% against. Mm. Two to one. And what was the question? The question was, are you in favour of using nuclear energy? It wasn't, do you want to study or have you got some sort of limp approach to this issue? It was straight down the line, do you want nuclear? Well, you got two to one in favour. So I think there's a fair move, and I'm seeing that all, all around Australia, a fair move to want at least be able to talk this. And the more we have the laws against it, that is a red flag at, at the issue not being discussed fairly and properly within the community. Absolutely. And I think one of the, to bring it back to how we started this conversation in, in wanting to have a rational and common sense talk about the energy transition, one of the things that always strikes me is that throughout history, we have moved from a less energy dense to a more energy dense form of generating uh, generating our power needs. Whereas this energy transition is going back to a less energy dense form of energy transmission for the first time in, in history. Whereas if you look at the amount of power you can get from a nuclear pellet relative to all other forms of energy that we're currently using, it is a hugely, hugely energy dense uh, form of of uh, form of energy and and that's not even getting the maximum out of it i mean i think you'd probably know this off the top of your head but is it something like we only use 20 percent of the uh of, of the energy from uranium in in the in the rods what's the on the first pass of a uranium fuel rod through a light water reactor the most plentiful types we get about three percent three percent wow three percent so you only get a conversion of about 3% of the heavy metal that goes into the fuel rod actually turns up as energy. Yeah. So um, there are types of reactors where we could multiply that figure by 30. Um, probably for the purpose of today, they're summarised as what we call generation four reactors where we use fast spectrum neutrons. But uh, you are quite correct in your observation about energy density. And the energy density equation is that prior to about 1650, when uh, 1650 AD, we got about 10 units out for every one in, we invested and people lived in virtual penury, okay? Um, we we're in serfdoms and agricultural societies, burning timber and dung, and there wasn't, you know, life was crook. Yep. After 1650, along came the burning of coal, the industrial revolution, and it jumped up to around about a 30 to one. So there was enough energy to create industry, to create things, and to enable people to move out of having to grow their own food and live in an agrarian lifestyle, to move into cities and to populate industry. And so education flourished. It was bloody awful for some people. I mean, you know, the Dickensian period, 
was not nice and all that coal burning in in the Birmingham and the Midlands and in and in parts of the Ruhr in Germany was an awful existence but yep. what it was doing it was on the course to having energy density lifting the lifestyles and standards of people with nuclear we don't have the coal pollution and we have a much cleaner and we're getting to 100 units out for every unit invested and i believe with those fast spectrum reactors we'll get up to the 200 so the energy density output for what we put in is improving dramatically and that's reflected in numbers i've done on um the materials consumption over a 60 year life time of 100% renewables in Australia versus um, nuclear. And over the about 60 year lifetime with all the replacement of the, the renewables, we're gonna use of the order of 380 million tonnes of gear, okay? That's, that's the order, it just doesn't include the transmission. That's just the wind, the solar, and all the pumped hydro and batteries, 380 million tonnes. If we did it with nuclear, we'd be down around the 35, 40 million tonnes, okay? About one-tenth, because their materials intensity is so low. I was out at Wellington recently looking at a wind turbine, four and a half tonnes of copper in a wind turbine. You know, there's 20 times the amount of copper in the wind turbine per unit of output than in a nuclear power plant. If we keep going down this route with 100% renewables, the last largest coal mine in the world, or, sorry, copper mine in the world is Escondida, I think, in Chile. Yep. We've got to have a new one of those every year. Okay. I mean, the numbers are mind blowing. Yeah. And there is no res resolution to this matter. So we need to be, and, and, and the silly part is that energy is the facilitator for other wealth creation in society. It is not of itself. The commodity we ought to be trading we ought Absolutely. to be using it as the lubricant to be out there building wonderful other things be it clothing food garments and uh, you know cut motor vehicles all the other things synthesizing fuels um all of those other things in society we should be doing well the history uh, of economic making... growth is a history of lower energy costs yeah yeah, that's what we sh that's the route we should be following. We're not doing that. We're locking ourselves in. Uh, you might have one or two more slides to, to go through, Rob, but just before you do that, final question from me, or nearly a final question. If we were to go down this route in Australia, how long would it take? I guess that's the other pushback from, from people who re reject the, the move to nuclear, is that it would just take too long. We don't have enough time. How long do you think it would take to um, have a, a at least the start of the nuclear industry in Australia. Okay, again, let's go to Preston. All right. The United Arab Emirates used the cookbook, cookie cutter approach that's prescribed in the International Energy Association. And they've got all of their structures sitting there. And we've got wonderful people like Helen Cook, a young lawyer in Australia, who's who advises internationally on the frameworks, the legal frameworks for this sort of stuff. And so we need to look at what's actually done by precedent. Now they have built their four plants there. They've, they've had a bit of a lag more due to need to train up people, but it's about a 10 year period and they probably had about three or four years pre-planning to build those. Let's go to other precedents around the globe. The French built 63 gigawatts in um, 22 years, okay? And people say, oh, well, they had an established nuclear industry. Well, yeah, they kind of had a few nuclear plants that were making weapons stuff, but they built pressurized water reactors from the United States and yeah. they had to populate that was 63. Get, get this, they built 58 reactors over this 22 year period. They, they had to train everyone up for that. The Canadians in Ontario, we've already seen the wafer rates, they're the same as us, same population as Victoria mm. plus New South Wales. If they can build 20, why 18 in 20 years, why can't we? And they built them before the PC got into the workplace. You know, our productivity should have improved. We have the established track record of building things like the Northwest Gas Shelf Projects, the LNG facility. And we've got a lot of engineering expertise in Australia that we could deploy. 
This too long or too expensive is used to procrastinate. It's yep. used to try to destroy the backbone in the Australian people to achieve things. That's what I want to push back on, that we've got to borrow from what the Canadians can do. They're the same as us. If they can do it, we can do it. And we've got to act with a bit more resolve to achieve these issues. And what we're doing now, we're letting our resolve be corrupted by these notions, oh, it would take too long or it's all too expensive or it's all too hard or it's all too dangerous. And what about the waste? I mean, it is a boring load of narrative all sitting out there to create hurdles. And if you want to uh, talk about um, cost overruns and and length of time, look at Snowy Hydro 2. I mean, that was... uh conceived in 2018 and i don't think the final date for that is probably going to be any closer than 2028 so you're looking at 10 years at least there for that and a, and a massive cost blowout well you know the listeners who the calculator can do some simple numbers it's not hard the capacity factor on snowy hydro too before we have had the latest implosion on the cost or explosion it was a 17 percent capacity factor now after turnbull fed us a crock over the cost of two billion sanity prevailed the tenders went out at about five and a half billion and clough picked it up with their italian partners and then they had added some transmission and then it was sitting up at around the five or seven billion dollar project cost and then when you look at 17 percent capacity factor and six percent return you ended up finding out the thing had to sell energy out at about 300 bucks over the buy sell price so if they're buying the power in at say 20 bucks they had to get a delta of 300 bucks over on top of that to make the thing viable at such a low capacity factor well now who knows what it is it's it's un, the, the problem the problem with that project is that i was a fan of it i mean I'm a, my career is in building dams you know i was yep. sympathetic to the darn thing but its execution has been abysmal um and uh and now there is probably no number you can really sell that thing into the market. It'll always be paid by the taxpayer. It doesn't have a place in the market. It, it'll be used, but it won't be used economically. It'll be uneconomic, yeah. Totally uneconomic, unfortunately. Well, Rob, we've been going for uh, some time, so I am conscious of, of your time. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on? We've, we've covered quite a bit of ground. No, I, I think we've covered it well, and I think there's it's we've we've looked at the costs we've looked at the precedent we've looked at the reason need for national resolve and to the people who are watching this video and they're thinking about the investments i would say watch out for for the renewable bandwagon i think it's full of of pain because i think as we build more and more of it solar is going to start to eat their lunch because you get this duck curve effect whereby there'll be oversupply and there is a big risk on the build out of the uh, transmission grid. And we've seen this play out in California where they've got the highest prices on mainland US. You've got uh, the energy vendor, which is not going well. You're seeing a return back to nuclear in uh, across Europe. And so I think you probably are wise to be looking at, at um, the uranium play. Um, but apart from that, Thank you for your time, and I, I hope I've answered most of your questions. I think it's been uh, it's been excellent. Uh, you know, big thanks for your insights and expertise. And as we follow this story, I'd, I'd love to get you back on down the track to see how things are playing out in the nuclear space in Australia. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for your time. All right. Thanks everyone for watching, and we'll be back again uh, soon. Bye. Thanks for joining. What's not priced in your weekly source of unique ideas in the Australian stock market. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please show your support by liking and subscribing and turn those post notifications so you don't miss a thing. And uh, stay tuned for the upcoming episodes as we delve into new topics, new trends and new stocks. Thanks for your support. Hope to see you next week.